This is an oral history interview for the John F. Kennedy Library with Ann Lincoln, the housekeeper at the White House. This is Nancy Hogan, the interviewer, and the date is February 9th, 1965, and the place is Mrs. Lincoln's office in the White House. And let's start out uh, by just asking when you fir first met Mrs. Kennedy. I guess it was probably within two or three days of when we started in January. I don't even remember the circumstances. I think she was having a picture taken for the, the heart girl of the year. Or this was before year. the inauguration? No, this is after, after the, inauguration. the inauguration. You had already come to Washington? I had already come to Washington. Then let's go back into how you got your job with Mrs. Kennedy. Well, I was working in New York, uh, and knew Tish Aldrich very well, and when Mrs. Kennedy asked Tish to come and be her social secretary, Tish asked me if I was interested in coming to Washington at the time. I, I just didn't know. I said, well, it will depend on the job. So she said, oh, well, send me a resume. So I sent her a resume, and she wrote, or call Mrs. Kennedy and read her my resume over the phone. <laughs> Mrs. Kennedy said, oh, that's fine, you know. This was December? Of this was in December, the end of December of 1960. I think I had all of 10 days notice before I came down and uh, actually even rented my first apartment over the telephone. <laughs> the landlady sent me floor plans and I telephoned her. So I'd never even seen my apartment when I came. That's how quickly I had to move. No Mrs. Kennedy. No Mrs. Kennedy. But you first met her? Actually, I had met her many years ago in Spain, which um, we were all at Pamplona um, for the bullfights. Uh, she and her sister were there, and, and then they left for Madrid. And uh, I saw her again in Madrid, but she wouldn't remember that. That was a long time ago. Well, in 1961, then, from January until about October of 62, you were working directly with Tish Baldrige. That's right. And then in the spring of 61, uh, I went to New York with Mrs. Kennedy on a short trip and then down to Palm Beach. And that, on the trip back from Palm Beach, was the first time I ever met the president. Oh, really? No. What was your first impression of him? Well, I was terrified because um, Pierre had sort of motioned for me to come up into the cabin and Mrs. Kennedy was sitting at a table with Mrs. Fulbright and Peter Lawford. And the president was sort of sitting on the left talking to Senator Fulbright. And I just sort of snuck in and sat down. And he suddenly turned around to me and he said, you must be in. And I said, yes, I am, sir. And he said, you have a good time. Uh -huh. So that was the first thing I ever remember about him was just, did you have a good time? In, and your trip to New York before was just with Mrs. Kennedy? We just went up to, uh, yes, to do some shopping and nothing, you know, it was, you know, nothing official, it was just a personal trip. In, in the years that you were over in the East Wing with Tish, did you deal directly with Mrs. Kennedy very much? Or? Yes, she phoned quite frequently and she also wrote a great many notes about things she wanted done. So we heard from, I'd say, practically every day. What type of things did you work on then? Actually, at that time, I seemed to be in charge of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I spent a great deal of time on the phone to uh, talking to Kay McGowan at Ola Cassini, and then I called various other places in New York to have clothes sent down. Because you see, she really, in a way, was trapped here, and it, it was very, Difficult. She couldn't go up to me and go to all the different stores to see what was available. And then she'd send over clippings from magazines and uh, sections, say, of the New York Times, but she wanted a book. And of course, in Washington, I never had a book, so I'd have to order the book and the records and also and setting up hairdresser appointments. And it was a lot of personal. Did she choose her clothes very quickly or? Uh, I'd say yes, she did. She knew exactly what she liked. I mean, you could give her, I would say, 25 dresses and she could pick out the exact tray that would be right on her. Without trying them on. Oh, yes, literally without trying them on. And she could look at sketches, too, and, and say, I want to see that. And she was very rarely, I'd 
did she ever send anything back? Did she or didn't she wear a wig? <laughs> she wore a wig at con. <laughs> I think that first came out in Joan Kennedy's article. Uh, yes, well, it makes perfect, perfect good sense. Um, I think she, as I remember, she got the wig. She may have had it before, but I know she had it wig for India. And that was, uh, that trip was in spring, I think, of 62. But when you're traveling, you have to have every hair in place, and don't have a hairdresser with you, it's really bad convenient to have a wig. Well, um, did, did the public reaction to this, is that something that would bother Mrs. Kennedy, or would she take this quite easily, or this was one of the burdens she had to bear in the White House? Oh, I just feel it. She really, I mean, we, we never said anything about it, and then, I, and then I think it was Joan Kennedy, wasn't it, in an uh, interview for Look, who said that she wore the wig. I don't think it bothered Mrs. Kennedy at all, but I think up until that time, she figured it was nobody's business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which it isn't. Which it isn't any more than if you dye your hair. You know, it's nobody, really nobody's business. Well, and the American public, of course, believe that, that they want to know every aspect of the first family yeah. life. And, and uh, was this a difficult thing for her to accept as a woman? Yeah. That, that, uh, I think... In your relationship? Yes, I, I, think, I think that she had a definite sense of privacy. And I think that's why... Pam was such an excellent press secretary um, because she reflected Mrs. Kennedy's feelings and would not give out the personal details that they would just laugh up. And Pam always had such good common sense and, and I know Mrs. Kennedy was very pleased with the job she did. Can you recall any specific uh, things that you worked on in 1961? Well, the spring of 61 was taken up pretty much with the trip to Paris. And then, and then from there, and rather from Vienna, she went to London for the christening of her niece, and then went to Greece. And that seems... That, that, of course, went into the summer of 61, the, the trip to Greece. And then I believe she was away, uh, except she came down from the Cape for the Pakistan dinner. That was the one uh, about Did you work on, on the details of dinners like this yes. at that time? Oh, yes. But that, uh, that trip, that uh, party at Mount Vernon, we went down there oh, three or four times. Uh, to, to check every detail and decide where the tent was going to be put and where the shell would be put and how the army, where the army trucks that brought the food down were going to be. And then, uh, of course, the tent had to be decorated and we had um, people down who volunteered their services from New York. And setting up the marquee in the town, it was, that was a real production, that party. Was the original idea of Mrs. Kennedy's? Or mm -hmm. was it? And I think she got the idea, I assume she got the idea from the party that they had in Royal and Powers that it, De Gaulle gave for them out at Versailles. And that's why I, I think she thought it would be nice to use some of our national monuments as backgrounds for uh, state occasions. This was the only one that was held up. This is the only one. Uh, and it, as you know, I think it's probably the most spectacular party that has been given in the White House yeah. for years. Um, you'd mentioned something about the ducks. Oh yeah, I, I don't know why, but that spring I can remember the ducks down on the pond, and I sort of always missed those since. But the reason we had to get rid of them was Charlie <laughs> chased them. The dog. The dog. Yeah, Caroline's dog. He gave him such a hard time that uh, we never had to have the ducks ever again. I guess with dogs around, it's just not too safe having ducks in the farm. Uh, who first suggested that they be moved out to Rock Creek? Was that Mrs. Kennedy? I think, or it, the, I think it was Mrs. Kennedy, I'm not sure. Might, might have been one or the other. I'm not sure. Did Caroline miss them? I don't think, I don't know. I never heard any comment. But that was the spring, too, that Caroline's hamster died. They disappeared. <laughs> on the third floor? On the, yeah, on the second floor. 
Never to be found? Never to be found. I, a very sad story. But uh, I think the hamsters had baby hamsters, and then the baby, as I remember, the mother hamster ate the babies. And I had quite a time explaining it to Carol. We'll <laughs> probably have to delete that. Was Mrs. Kennedy upset at the thought of hamsters lost in the second floor? Or oh, no. Was she so. very casual about most of the minor things <coughs> that would arise? No. She really was. She took things. She, my, I mean, the dogs were not in the house, uh, a lot, particularly the police dog wasn't allowed in the house, but I think down in the country she had the dogs in the house. Wasn't there at least some, at some time I thought I read that the president was allergic to dogs? I think he was allergic to the long hair. Not the short hair. But, but not the short hair, I'm not sure. I think Kushinka, because she had long hair, if you remember, she was a little white snowball kind of, and I, I, I think it was allergic to her, I'm not sure. Because I know Mrs. Kennedy had her upstairs the first couple of days when she arrived, and then she was moved out. That's the dog of President Khrushchev's son. Yeah. Did, uh, I mean, one of the highlights of, of the social life in the White House under the Kennedys was the Nobel Prize dinner. Did you work on that? Oh, yes. That was the... The president, I think, took more interest in that party than any other. Tish was away at the time. I guess she was off with Mrs. Kennedy on some trip, I can't remember. And the president, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, was working on a guest list with Fred Halbert. Was this the president's idea? This was the president's idea. And I think it was about two days after he had the idea. He called up and wanted to know where the list was. Called you? Yeah. Well, I called Arthur Schlesinger and he said, well, we we're just starting on this. And so that was that. But about two days later, the uh, president was even more impatient about it, and he had one of the phone telephone operators call Pam and ask Pam if the, the invitations had gone out yet. Pam <laughs> said, that was just. But then the... It was a very successful dinner, and uh, about oh, know, four or five days later, the president called. It was about 2.30 in the afternoon, he was upstairs resting. And he says, hey, Anne, have you seen the bank uh, ready issue of right? And I said, no, Mr. President, I haven't. He said, well, there are 20 pages on the dinner. He said, it's just wonderful. He said, I'll send it right over for you to say. I said, well, thank you very much. And then he calls me. He said, no, I guess maybe I'd better leave it here until Jackie gets back from the country. Oh. <laughs> but he was terribly pleased that he'd had such co wonderful coverage of his party. Was it the president that said that uh, never there was more scholarship in the White House, or more intellect in the White House? That well, that was the famous quote in the speech when he... I don't remember the exact words, but it was to the effect that never had uh, so had so much brain power been assembled under the roof of the White House. And then he paused, and then he said, with possible exception, when Thomas Jefferson ate dinner here alone. Well, that's marvelous, but one of his best. The um, you changed jobs then in, in about October, November of 1962. Uh, uh, yes, that's right. Uh, under under what? I think Ms. Kennedy is called a reorganization of her staff. Uh, were there problems? What were the problems that led up to this change? I think the, pro the chief problem was that Mrs. Kennedy uh, wanted somebody in this particular job with whom she felt she could communicate mm -hmm. more readily mm -hmm. than she had been able to do with this office in the past. The the previous woman had been here a long time. Or she had been here a long time, and uh, I, it was just one of those situations that uh, Mrs. Kennedy found the food bills enormously high and felt the time had come <laughs> to, um, well, that they had to cut down. And so she had to have somebody in this particular job. That, would be able to cut down. Was the president personally concerned about this as well? Oh, yes, he was. Actually, one night before a state dinner, he came downstairs a few moments early, walked into the usher's office and sat down and proceeded to discuss the 
In some detail, the milk bill at Hyannis. <laughs> Nancy Tuckerman remarked afterwards that I've never seen him sit still for that long or be that interested in anything for more than five minutes. Well, now this, if Miss Tuckerman was here, this was after. This was in 1960. Uh, it was the fall of 63. But he was personally involved. Oh, yes. And he was very. He, he, he liked to see the monthly food reports and got. Uh, he was, I think the reason he was particularly interested in the food bills is he asked me how they were, and I said they were quite well, except for the food, except for the milk bill at my annex. And he then just said to tell me, well, I didn't see how it could be terribly high, because he hadn't been there much of the time. That's what brought on the milk bill. Could you describe just for a minute, minute what your duties are, what Mrs. Kennedy set up? Uh, as your well, particular and sole responsibilities as a housekeeper? It's sort of a long... Uh, well, primarily, I supervise the maids and the butlers and make up a schedule for the maids. Uh, formerly, they did not have any firm schedule. They work a 40-hour week and then work in shifts. And I tried to set it up in such a way that every third weekend, uh, one girl would have, the girl would have the weekend off. They all get two days off a week, but normally it was just sort of hit and miss. Then, of course, you know. Was this a problem that Mrs. Kennedy was personally She never knew. Uh, I don't know whether she was concerned about it, but um, I think she just sort of felt that they were rather disorganized. You know, she didn't know who was here and who wouldn't be here. This is why we have a chart upstairs and you can just look at the chart and see who's on, who's off. Then, of course, all the things I've seen with the silver's polished and that spots are taken off skirts of, you know, from sofas and the draperies get sent to the cleaners and curtains get washed and the usual routine. I've seen that the house is maintained. One of the new functions I think Mrs. Kennedy transferred to you was complete meal planning. Yes. Or state uh, that, had been, that had been done over in the social office, and she went, and she transferred that over here. And w w how we would work is Renee would give me several suggestions, and we'd talk about it, and then I would send Mrs. Kennedy a memo with the suggestions, and she often has not would change it to something that she thought might be better, and then again she just write okay and send it back down here. Then in this office we have all the ordering of the food, uh, not only for the family, but for the official entertaining account, the State Department, and the staff which means keeping all those four accounts have to be kept separately, and all the food has to be kept separately, and all the wines have to be kept separately that are purchased on those four accounts. To say nothing must be quite a bookkeeping <laughs> yeah, to say nothing with the bookkeeper. <laughs> and then, of course, this office orders, if we need more sheets, I go out and buy them. If we need uh, to order uniforms for the maids, they come down and give us their sizes and measurements also, butler's uniforms. Were the uh, things like the maid's uniform and, and the sheet something that Mrs. Kennedy would take a personal well, interest in? Well, she took a in. great deal of interest. The, the uniforms, are, are, I think, have been pretty much standard. The, the maids wear white during the day, just plain white and tailored uniforms. And then the uh, in the evening, they were black with white aprons and cuffs. But she took a great deal of interest in the linens. And trying to sort of, you know, see that we have something extra nice for when we have guests from all over the world coming to stay in. Now, would these be left in the White House? These are left in the White House, yes. They come out of the White House and the annual budget for the running of the house. She was interested in every detail of the house. I mean, as you know from the redecorating, and then once you redecorate, you want everything else to fit in. I mean, upstairs, for instance, we had 
We didn't have decent hangers in the guest closet. Just small details. But, but time consuming, and she took an interest in everything of that sort. Even down to what magazines are and what yeah, bedrooms? Yes, that, and, um, again, uh, the, 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 there was no provision for any magazines for the guest room. So she, we now have weekly magazines that go in the room, but before that, sometimes you find something that was seven or eight months old. And also, she, I think, had, eventually, we finally would have been able to do the same thing about keeping current books available. I think I saw that she had American Heritage put in the Lincoln Room. Yeah, we had American heritage. It shows her sense of history. Yeah. She had a great sense of it. But she was very concerned about details. Mm. Everything from how pens worked and to, to what kind of note paper she wanted and writing paper and pen holders and good response. I mean, you probably saw it from those memos. Well, for a house that has 52 or yeah. some odd rooms, Mm -hmm. The concerned in detail about each yeah. detail in each room was quite a time-consuming job. It was, and uh, fortunately we, met, we practically finished. Uh, there were a few more things on the third floor and a few more things on the first floor to be done, but it was pretty, the whole redecorating was pretty much. I think she wrote you a number of memos about ashtrays. Seem to have an obsession with oh, ice oh, yes. oh, she did. Yeah. That, that, was, any of the that, was, that was another thing. Well, we always have a great ashtray problem here because they get broken. And uh, she would get certain sets of ashtrays, and then one would be broken, and then another would be broken, and then we'd have to sort of start in all over again on that one. And this went on throughout the house. Fortunately, um, we still only have a stamp inside of some that she went out one day and went out for about 30. <laughs> and they're sort of lead bottom things to be used because we had such a high breakage. But now it seems that those are big. So have you seen those low stock reproductions? No. John. <laughs> hmm. I think she was concerned that, that as many of you put yeah. back together as possible. Yeah. That, uh, but, it, but we had. Sometimes I'm afraid the ashtrays were, we shouldn't have had as good ashtrays around as we did because we just have too high a breakage. Pick people, get into rooms that are crowded and get Most pushed off. Most of this on the first floor in the, the state room, the first not in the floor. living quarters. Not in the living quarters, but in the state. When they have large parties, they can't help it. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's just like that off the goes. And uh, problems with guests dropping ashes in the White House, I mean, something that bothered her. <laughs> Yes, that was another thing. Uh, they were the first, I believe, the first president in his wife who permitted people to smoke here at uh, large receptions and cocktail parties. And there are people, as you know, who just have absolutely no respect for anyone else's uh, property. In, even in the White House? Even in the White House. Is this something that would just irritate her? Or was it yes, she she say, she'd see somebody it. standing at a reception. With a, with a cigarette and then just literally flicking ashes on the carpet. She'd want to go give them an ashtray. And she'd like to go running up and give them an ashtray, but um, you can't do it when you've got 300 people in a row. But instructions were given to the butlers to yeah. wash the ashtrays as well as the yeah. empty drinks. Oh. Okay. Take that. I think, I think one of the funniest stories about all of this at the big parties is one night she saw one of the guests slip a bare May knife into his pocket. <laughs> oh, no. Yes. <laughs> and after dinner, she asked Charles to check the bare May. Guest slip a, one of the bare May knives into his pocket. So she asked Charles, the head butler, if he would check the bare May to see if there was any mess in it. And Charles reported that this was missing. So she went right up to him and asked him for it back. <laughs> <laughs> did he give it back? Yes, he did. <laughs> did he just hand it to her? Well, the reason I'm really bringing this up is, is, is this business. We talk about ashtrays. 
it, it appalls me that after one function we had, we were missing 15 silver teaspoons, two silver nut dishes, and four silver ashtrays. I hope the White House is insured. <laughs> we are not insured, but people come here with the idea that this is their property. So they just help themselves. I mean, I gather over the years, this has been a constant problem. I mean, the demi spoons and teaspoons are the one thing that disappear. <coughs> I just think it's terrible. They should get insured. Well, we couldn't get insurance on the basis of that. Yeah, I guess you could. <laughs> I'll wait on the back of her now. She, uh, there was quite a lot of newspaper coverage on the fact that the White House finally started printing their state menus in English. Um, I, well, that was a constant, uh, problem. Naturally, when anything comes from that day, it's in French. Then traditionally, it always been. Uh, tradition well, no, the Eisenhower's menus were in English. Oh, were they? Yeah. Uh, insofar as you can have English when they're French names to a dish, some of them you just couldn't possibly, it wouldn't make sense being put in English. But when Rene came originally, we did most of the menu in French. And then I think the president felt there were just too many people who didn't understand it. So it got to the point where it was half French, half English. And then finally towards the end, we were doing them pretty much everything. I mean, there are certain words like a bone, uh, which cannot be translated. But I don't know anything that could be made it, you know, clear in English, we did. So we, but there really wasn't anything very startling about that. That's the press one. Well, I, but I think the, everyone thought that this was the president who wanted to do this. Um, I noticed in one memo to you, Mrs. Kennedy said that she definitely wanted everything in English, and she had always been against this being in French. Well, someone of her background that wondered whether it was... I don't so know, but she had always been. He probably just got up after one meal and was... And I just thought, well, let's have it all in English. I, I don't think she ever was against having it in French, because after all, she spoke French fluently, and it would never pose any problem to her. I think it was probably the president who felt it was maybe more democratic to have it all in English. Although, when, when it comes right down to it, if you go to any good restaurant, the menu has been very was in French. The, uh, many of the memos that she would write to you, she'd use the phrase, I want this done quickly and efficiently. Yeah. Was she always demanding in this way? And, and yeah, as you say, I think yeah. she had a right to expect that everything would be yeah, done. Yeah, I, I think they were both uh, that way. In fact, I know they both were. When they wanted something done, they wanted it th done right away, not six weeks hence or even a week hence. I mean, if it was something that could be done right away, you did it right away. Did she ever run into any problems in the staff with people who, who weren't able to work? Uh, no, I don't think so. But when she said she wanted something pronto, she meant just what she said. But uh, no, I don't re remember any time when she was fussing about how long it took. Did you have uh, anything to do with any of the president's trips abroad? Oh, uh, well, one trip, abroad, um, we went down to Costa Rica. She did not go on that trip. And I gather there was the facilities at the embassy there were such that we had to do most of the planning and also send most of the food and the china and the silver from here. And also we had to have tables built for a luncheon. It was, it was quite a production, but they just did not have the facilities down there to cope with the state mountain. So we did, we sent my, all the basic <coughs> uh, things for that particular party from here. And Renee? Uh, I don't know whether Renee went or not. I can't remember. I honestly can't. In, in the memos at one point, she had said she wanted all three cooks to go. And then I don't know how it ended up, Helen. I just can't remember. He may have gone, but I, I'd have to ask him.
<laughs> I have to ask my mother. Uh, later, in about June of 63, she wrote to a memo saying she didn't want anything ever lent out of the White House again, such as silver. Um, were there any problems with I that silver? Was I, a, I don't know. what the, I can't remember what happened, but I think people in the West Wing would, would decide to have a little party and would send over the glass and china and... Um, <coughs> <clears throat> at their home. No, no, no. I mean, right in the, right over in the offices over there. And I think maybe I may have said something to her about it that I didn't feel we should be sending White House property over there that the Navy men should look after them. And that's why she probably wrote and said, it really was probably an agreement with something I may have mentioned to her. But, I mean, the Costa Rican trip is the one that, only one I can remember where we sent China and silver and linens. Did the president personally take an interest in all of this, or was he no, not aware? That, no, I don't think. Uh, I mean, I think you may have got from the memo. She was concerned that it would be the president's party would run as smoothly as possible and be as nice as possible. But I don't think the president had any idea of what was involved. During most of your year in in the. Uh, or at least seven months of your year, Miss Kennedy was pregnant. Uh, did this have any noticeable effect on, on how she ran the White House or on her interests? Or no, it didn't. Um, actually, I didn't have any inkling that she was pregnant until the day before, or the day that it was announced to the press in Palm Beach. And she called me in Palm Beach because she wanted someone to come down there. And she said, I've got to have all my clothes let out. And I, it was on the tip of my time to say, oh, well, we have to have all your clothes let out for you. When I have a baby, you can mind a lot. It's none of my business. And that afternoon is when, right after church on Easter Sunday, is when I believe Pierre announced that she didn't tell you on the phone. No, she, she, I didn't say anything. I mean, and she just said, well, she wants somebody to come down and let out her clothes for her. So, you know. That was that. Having had uh, five pregnancies before and losing three, was, was mm. she apprehensive about this one? Or was, was she hopeful? Or did you notice this at all? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, she was in very good spirits. And you see, well, let's see, the last time I saw her before Patrick was born was, I think, the end of. It was the end of May she came in here and we were talking about linens and things to order. And then I went off on a, my vacation and picked up the president in Rome and came back. And she had gone to the Cape, so I never saw her again until um, that following fall. She spoke with her on the phone a number of times, but, but I never, that summer, I mean, really didn't hear too much from her from my aunt's. Had a nursery been prepared here? Yes, that was very sad. We had everything um, set up. There's a little sitting room upstairs, which is off the room that John was in, and we had that all fixed up as a nursery. And uh, actually, she just written me a note to buckle out and buy some baby hangers oh. about ten days before uh, Patrick came, and I was one thing I postponed because I knew that she wouldn't be coming back with Patrick until at least, uh, I think Patrick wasn't expected until mid-September and he came in mid-August, if I remember, the sixth, I remember correctly. So I hadn't gone, fortunately hadn't gone out and, and bought the hangers. I don't think we had really, but the whole room was fixed up and then I know that the second, when Patrick died, I know we got up there just as fast as we could and took everything out and put it all away and even tore down the little clothes poles we put up for the baby clothes so the president wouldn't see it when he came back. Did you see him very shortly thereafter? I saw him the following. I can't remember. I think he came back here the following Monday and then he left again on Tuesday to go back to be with her. I saw him there. But we wanted to get that room cleared out just as 
fast as we could. Was his attitude feelings about this very noticeable at that time? Uh, it's typical example. No, Kathy Curry. No, really didn't allow no. To show it. I, I didn't see him, or nor did he call for any reason. Although the person who told me, Dave Powers, said that he had taken it very, very much to heart. But I didn't really, I, I, I mean, I saw the pastor walking through the hall, but, I you know, not talk to or anything. How about Mrs. Kennedy when she came back? She was fine when she came back. Which was three or four weeks later. Well, it? let's say, I don't think she came back until they went to Newport for a while. I don't think she came back until the end of September. Mm -hmm. I think the next visit after that was President Tito. He was it. Yes. Did she take as much interest in, in this, that Yes. Year? Oh, yes. But um, I think the President was, as I said, I know from people who had been around him at the time that so he had taken this very much to heart and very upset. Between August and November, did you person have any uh, chance to call you on the phone for anything? Yeah. Well, the last time he called was, I guess, about a week before he left the Dallas. We had a lunch. We'd had a, just had a luncheon, and he called and he said. Um, I like that first course we had today. It was crab meat, wasn't it? And I said, yes, Mr. President. Then he said, and tell Renee the peas were overcooked. And <laughs> since lamb down the receiver, that was the end of that conversation. And that's the last, uh, now that's the last conversation I can... Did he often call you mainly on, on food items? Can you no, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't call that frequently. I'd run into him in the hall sometime when he was coming back from the swimming pool on his way upstairs for lunch. And that's when he'd stop and chat and find out how things were going. Find and interested in the, how the food bills were. <laughs> uh, what prompted the green stamp? So they, oh, I think what prompted the green stamp was that um, record. Now, do you remember that one? Oh, was the first called? family. The okay. first family. And do you remember there's one item, little sentence about somebody saving green stamps? And I'm sure they were both sitting upstairs listening to this, and, and the president probably turned to her and said, we must be getting thousands of green stamps. <laughs> and I'm sure that's what prompted that note. What is happening with all the green stamps? Because not only did she write me that memo, but he called Mr. West the next day, the chief washer, to ask him what was happening to the green staff. So from then on, you saved green stamps. So from then on, we saved all. Did they ever cash them in? No. <laughs> I think we had about seven or eight books, though, which I turned over to Quinn Hill when she left here. I said, here, so it's your responsibility on. now. Did you have uh, much opportunity to observe Mrs. Kennedy with the children? Yes. I think the... <coughs> The public was quite aware of Mrs. Kennedy's concern to be with her children. On the other hand, there was always a lot of speculation that, uh, and figuring out that she was really out at Glenora or up at the Cape or down in Palm Springs when she was with them. No, I, I, I'm... They were sent off to the country and she was here. Oh, uh, no, actually not. Um, when she... I mean, for instance, on Friday afternoons when she went down to the country, she invariably took the children with her. So they would ride and they did things together all the weekend. When she was here, um, she, I think, spent a great, I think she spent a great deal more time than anyone would suspect with them. Often in the afternoon, she'd take them out, out to the zoo or she'd invite children over and they'd play down on the lawn. And as you know, Caroline had a pony here for a while. And I don't think she left them alone a great deal because when she went to Palm Beach, and I'd say nine times out of ten, the children went. When she went to High Hatters, the children went. The children were with her most of the time. 
except when she went on trips. And, and then they did go to Italy with her. Yeah, and then she took Caroline to Italy the summer she went to Italy. The only times she didn't take the children really were on state visits. And the last trip that she made in the fall of uh, 63, when she went to Greece and to Morocco. That was a private trip. No, she was gone for, I think, about two weeks. And Caroline couldn't have gone because she was in school. Did the White House school have any effect on the staff? Did they sort of enjoy having children? Oh, yes. It, 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 I think the White House enjoyed and loved having the children here. Understood under the Eisenhower administration, the staff was not around very much. And that, that initially, after Mrs. Kennedy came in, they were always popping in the broom closets whenever the family would appear. No, they, they weren't doing that at all. But um, after all, when it comes right down to the president, has so little privacy that it's always been sort of a policy of the maid not to be around in on the second floor where they can be seen when he's there or when she's there. Not seeing there, there wasn't any popping into closets, but uh, they even now they don't make they they're not working upstairs when somebody's in the sitting room. They're not in sight. They get into the rooms when the president and the Mrs. Kennedy left, and they go in and do the cleaning then. That's how it works. Mr. Uh, the President, I, I think everyone agrees, wanted weekends away from the White House to get away from the desk and to relax. Did, did Mrs. Kennedy need this as much, do you think, as, as he did? Uh, yes, because I think she, in the first place, I think she loves being outdoors. I mean, she could go out and walk in the garden here, and, and, and she loves to ride, and she liked to play tennis, and I think it, I think she liked to get away from here, too. Because, as she said, you could never really consider the White House home. There are too many people around. And I think it was necessary, I think it's necessary for the president, anybody to get have a change of air, so to speak, and I think it was good for him because after all his back was bothered, it was a good chance to get away and relax. At one point during the menus, I see that the president was on a no vegetable, no fruit diet. What was, uh... Oh, I don't know. He always had, as far as I could gather, had a problem, sort of a tricky, I don't know whether it was an allergy or a, something that caused by nerves or what, and he used to have to go on these diets where he had all bland food. I mean, things have to be in cream sauces or puree. And Sounds like an ulcer. And, uh, well, I don't, I don't think he had an ulcer. I don't really know what exactly what it was, but you may have noticed that Mrs. Kennedy said some, at one point, I will have a salad to brighten up the all-white meal. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know what it meant. Is it gone very long? Or no, it went, it, it went on... Um, for periods, and then, it, then he seemed not to be on it anymore, but one never knew. Um, it, it was, as I remember that, it was only during one period, but Miss Shaw told me that for years he'd been having troubles and had to go on a special diet. But what was wrong, I never really knew. Did Mrs. Kennedy ever, ever go in the kitchen and oh, take yeah. a late snack or cook dinner uh, by herself at the time? N not that I know of. I don't really think she knows how to, I don't think she knows how to cook or she's a marvelous cook because she knows food. But she's never you, you can tell that she knows what, what things she has like, but she's just never done any cooking to my knowledge. All I know soup. is that the president loved soup before he went to bed. And uh, we have a can opener up there on the second floor, and I think it took him about eight months to learn how to use it. Really? Yeah. I don't know. He always did the wrong thing with it, and then he'd explain it to him. And I mean, that can opener caused a great deal. I don't know. I think if Mrs. Kennedy didn't go in and open it. I don't think she knew how to use it. I don't know. I don't know. But I'd hear from the butlers in the morning, oh, the poor president had trouble with the can opener again last night. I think that's delightful. Are there any more like those? Uh, no, except speaking of this diet, 
um, they would leave out soups for him so, so he could select what he wanted before he went to bed. And it seems that at one point when he was on one of these diets, one of the things he couldn't have was tomato. So somebody left out a can of cream tomato soup, and he'd written, great big no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, he the paper and left it there. So they told me about the next morning when it's a crime. But, the, but you know, they never, we never knew, really. Did the children usually eat early and then go to bed, or did they all uh, have a typical family dinner? The children ate lunch, and Mrs. K, when she was here, she ate lunch with them. And then the president came on later. He, was, he usually had lunch about 1.30 or so. And then the children ate supper, um, usually around 6. And then Miss Shaw would get them all ready for bed, and then they the president would have them all in his office, and then some nights he would even take them swimming, and she would be outraged. Oh, really? I guess we well, would come out and hair all be wet, and she'd have to dry them all off. And, but uh, the children did eat early. They ate generally around six out of supper then. And then the president's candy ate anywhere between eight and eight thirty. And if he was away, she usually ate supper with the children. I mean, the whole time he was in Europe on that. Latin trip to Rome and, and uh, England. He, uh, she ate with him every night. And she often did up in high honors too. It really doesn't matter. She'd have something with him. Were there often many of the nieces and nephews running around the White House too? No, Staying. not really. Um, Steve Smith used to come. You see, it was really what Steve, Stevie Smith was more Caroline's age. And then Sidney Lawford would come with the Lawfords. And then uh, the Rodsville children would come for a while. But we didn't have too many. Was the first family do much private entertaining? Um, I'd say about two nights a week. They'd Just have one couple or two? You, or you well, know. yeah, maybe two couples. Three couples, the most. I mean, it was mostly the old close friends like the Bartlett's and the Browleys and people that they'd known for a long, long time they could relax with. But most of those evenings, or the immediate family, but they didn't have the um, large sort of business kind of dinner parties upstairs. They'd have one or two big parties a year. Well, no, well, she, private parties. Well, private parties. They'd have one or two big private parties, which were invariably a dinner dance. And that was about it. And they, oh, and on the weekends, they always had company. House guests. Yes. Yeah. One place for another. Yeah. <clears throat> but in, in your relationship with Mrs. Kennedy, would you say that, that uh, for you and Nancy and Tish and Pam that she was formal or informal? Did you all can see her in a, or ever see her in a sort of a social setting or just having lunch oh, together? Or oh, no. <coughs> not, not in that sense, but I mean, when she'd wander around here, she'd wander around here in a pair of boots and a pair of poochie pants and a pullover sweater, you know, that sort of thing. But. Uh, as far as uh, the, you know, that, no, we didn't, she was, she wasn't formal and she wasn't informal. It was just sort of a friendly, easygoing <coughs> relationship. Uh, of course, she had known Pam personally for many years before Pam came in here, and of course, Nancy, she'd known they'd been in school together, so. I think her relationship with them was more as a personal friend and it would have been with Tish and myself and she did not know that in that way. Did she and Tish clash personally at all or? Um, <coughs> well, they clashed but Mrs. K was very good at avoiding, let's say, out and out clashes. I think that she, I think it was 
a matter of two people just going in opposite directions. I mean, Tish had her concept of what she thought Mrs. Kennedy should do be doing, and Mrs. Kennedy had her own ideas about what she wanted to do, and that's where the conflict. I think she wrote you <coughs> in October that she wanted to leave a, a legacy of a White House that was well run and in good taste. Um, that, along with being a mother and a wife, mm -hmm. really her concept of what a first lady should be. I, I, I definitely think so, yeah. I think she accomplished that. Uh, I do. I think she accomplished an incredible amount when you think of a relatively short time. She had to do it. And there was a great deal to be done. Not just in the restoration, and in, uh, in well, things like flowers yes, in every room. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the flowers, and uh, it, as I say, it was the details. I mean, she had the, the shell, but she certainly had nothing else. And I mean, the flowers, her interest, all of those books there are filled with pictures of flower arrangements that we had for every single function mm -hmm. while they were here. And it's a very nice and interesting record to have. But that was just one of many, many things that she uh, sort of revised. Formally, they have very like, stiff, formal arrangements of flowers too big so you couldn't see yeah. it. Yeah, and, and, and she wanted them to learn to do them in such a way that they, oh, what is the, well, they're sort of those Dutch, you know, marvelous Dutch still lifes of flowers and that sort of thing. And the people in the bouquet room learned how to do them the way she wanted to. And this would just be speculation, Anne, but um, she did restore the White House in three years almost completely, and, and she did managed to uh, have it in a, in a wonderfully efficient and smooth working order when she left. Mm -hmm. um, if they had the other five years, uh, what do you think she would have put her energies in? Would she have thought, well, would she have done more of, of the, uh, not the cutting the ribbons to open the uh, thing, but would she have, do you think she would have gone to more Dallas's and more political activities? And I really don't know, because um, there, was, there, there was at least a year's more work here. Mm -hmm. See the ballroom hasn't been redone. down. All of the plans for that, and also the the dining room. There were a few things which would have, I say, a few, but it was about a year's work to have brought the house up to the point where, where I think she would have been happy. I frankly think she may have, in the next four years, then done more. Well, she may have done more things like the symphony and the cultural yeah. center and, and, and that sort of thing. Architecture yeah. in Washington. And, and uh, I also was very much surprised when I heard that she was going to Dallas. Because, as you know, I don't think she, well, I know she was pregnant in 1960 again, but she didn't do much campaigning then. But uh, when she said she was going on that, on the trip, well, when Nancy told me she was going on the trip to Dallas, I was really rather surprised because I thought, well, I didn't think she would be involving herself in the campaign. But it seems that she told Nancy that she was going to go on a lot of trips with him. Do you think this was her idea? Yes, I do. And at least going to older port, she enjoyed it up to, um, up to that moment. Oh, yes, and I think she probably would have done a lot of campaigning, but, but it's so hard to speculate, but as I say, I think once the house is finished, then she probably, as you say, would have gone on to the cultural center and other aspects outside of the house of the arts. Were you involved at all in, in the after-dinner entertaining state functions? Well, involved is it not really involved. Uh, how the entertainment, as, as you probably know, is usually Mrs. Kennedy would have about 17 different ideas about what kind of entertainment she wanted. And uh, then it was just a matter of Tish getting on the phone and getting hold of the manager or whoever, you know, whatever time the entertainment was. And then after that, um, 
all we ever did was, you know, they'd come down and tell us how long it would take, and, and we'd have programs printed up, and that sort of thing, the stage, of course, just not put out that they needed. But that's also done by the usher's office. Was she ever disappointed in any of the performances? Um, not that I can remember, really. At least if she was, we didn't hear about it. Was she, is she, was she the type of person who was very appreciative of everything that people did, or did most of this go unnoticed? Was she, uh, no, I don't think she was unappreciative. I, I think really, uh, she, she was the first one to know if anything went wrong, but by the same time that things were, went beautifully, she would be the first one to say so, that she was pleased. Do you all enter the maid then, the butlers? Well, to the uh, so yes, yeah, sometimes I should say, would you please, uh, type up a memo and put it on the bulletin board, that sort of thing. But then she would, if, I mean, if she saw Charles or if she saw Renee, she would tell him that she thought dinner had been splendid or everything had gone beautiful. But she, you know, I must say, I think she was the first one to praise when the praise was due. And again, again the first one to criticize if something had gone wrong. Anything more, made, I mean, more than just breaking the ashtrays or, uh, the drinks weren't no. going as smoothly as they should have. Well, for instance, the service. It's always been a problem at steak dinners because they seem to be getting larger and larger. And she'd be the first one to say, well, let's, you know, let's see that the service is as fast as we can possibly get it. Also, another thing, uh, she'd write me a note and say, well, the first course hadn't been as warm as it might have been. Tell them to rev up the warming ovens down there. And that sort of She'd notice. I mean, even down to the kind of candy that was on the table. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Um, on the point, I don't know what we, oh, yes, we had some things wrapped, or, you know, pink candy or something like that. She didn't want pink candy, so, you know, yes. little sugar candy. Do you think this is in contrast to other first ladies? I think people concern themselves with the areas that they're personally interested in. I think some person could sit down at a table and wouldn't know what it was set with or what the fruit looked like or what the flowers looked like or what the candy looked like. And another person would notice every detail. And now that the details are running so smoothly. You know, and she would notice. That's the type of thing she would notice. And write you a note about it to please change it. Was the person aware of uh, the new pieces of furniture and the new acquisitions alone, or would, would she bring them to his attention? I think she, I know she'd bring them to his attention, and I think she'd tell him about the story of uh, various pieces and where they'd been. But I don't think, on the whole, he was really concerned. Pleased with the finished product? Well, I think he was with pleased with the finished product, but when it was um, in the works, I don't know that he uh, had too much idea what was going on. She probably showed him sketches of how the rooms would look, 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 but I just don't think that he was particularly interested in that phase of the house. Do you want to finish any more? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's time it's full. <coughs> you want, how much longer? 